Okay, so all that doorbell ringing was for a good reason. The kid was delivering an invitation to his birthday party. I mean, this is a big deal. Um, so I think he's a second grader. So it kind of gives you an idea of, you know, maybe I don't think any of this is for like really on the money from Freud. So I don't think we can do too much like, I don't know. I think the psychosexual stages are where he goes a little crazy with this. And I don't know that I believe in them very much, but I, I guess we can see some ways where they might make some sense. So let's check it out. Um, the psychosexual stages, the first stage is oral stage. And this is this makes a bit of sense when you consider what does a person who has just been born and up to about one years of age, they are getting their nourishment through breastfeeding or through a bottle. They're not eating solid food, not until quite a while. And so this is where their energies are focused. The second stage is the anal stage, and you have probably heard this, oh, that person's anal, or I am, I'm an anal compulsive. What does this mean? We're going to get into that. Um, pleasure obtained by learning to control your bodily wastes. Now, if you're one to three, um, probably closer to three, you're going to be concerned with potty training. That's that stage that you're in, and we'll see more about stages when we get to development for certain, um, but this is Freud stuff here. So the next stage, stage three, is the phallic stage. And this makes a little bit of sense. If you've ever read Greek mythology, the phallic symbol is that of the male genitalia and, it, and how it deals with, this deals with incestuous feelings. So that's, that's the freaky Freud coming out for sure. The latency stage is stage four, and this is the suppression of sexual interest. You play mostly with the same sex, and the others have cooties. My son is kind of in the latency stage, and he is. Like, if you, um, you ask him, uh, should he invite girls to his birthday party in October? And he's like, I don't think I really know any girls to invite. Yeah, right. I think he knows some girls to invite, but he doesn't want to. He's suppressing those urges that he has for the opposite sex. And maybe, <laughs> maybe that's a good thing. I'm okay with that right now. Um, the fifth stage is from adolescence uh, and up and I guess this is adult sexuality these are people that have become comfortable and understand and are mature with what <clears throat> sex means and what that is about they're more comforting and mature in expressing and, and they have comfort in expressing their feelings for other people um, and those sexual feelings that they may have for them <clears throat> so if you think about these things, they kind of make some sense. And what is the phallic stage all about? In three to five, I don't know that I explained this as well, but that's that area where kids are like, well, I have this and you have that. And they start to figure out that men and women, the different genders, have some different equipment. And so they get very, very like focused on that sometimes. Um, you will hear a three to five-year-old sometimes say, when someone goes to the restroom, I know what he's going to do. He has a he has a pee pee or a penis or whatever. So those things will, will fly out of their mouth. In the fourth stage, in the latency stage, you're not going to hear kids say that because they are suppressing those feelings that they may have. Um, so these are Freud's theories of psychosexual stages. Let's see some more of this. This is the pink Freud, the freaky Freud. <clears throat> That's why I put this image there. Um, you have this idea of fixation. That means being stuck in a stage. You didn't move through it appropriately. And through, so throughout life you have issues with that stage where you're gonna struggle. So you can have a traumatic event occur there, maybe the death of a parent or there's an accident or maybe the kid was hospitalized during that stage and they just didn't get, maybe the parents have split up. And so these things can affect the stages. Could become an oral fixation. So you're going to have someone who later in life, if they're chewing on a pen all the time, like this, or if they're having trouble quitting smoking, or they overeat, what are they trying to say about me? Just because I'm wearing a Chewy's Pink Freud too. That's messed up. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, they constantly have something in their mouth, or they're, they're nail biters, or bite their nails. Maybe this is the fixation of the oral stage, is what uh, Mr. Freud said. Uh, 
the oral fixation again you see that up there at the top and I kind of put all three here <clears throat> the anal fixation or anal retentive person could be controlled and orderly maybe when they were going to be potty trained the parents were so rigid about it so rigid that and so orderly that they developed a fixation on this and they're very very neat they're anal retentive or anal fixated anal expulsive is the other side maybe their parents didn't do a good job of cleaning up when they were having a mess or diaper training or whatever and this this messy and disorganized stage comes out this whole idea of oral fixation and you see a lot of times Freud with a cigar and so this whole idea that the cigar is really something else okay sometimes a cigar is just a cigar there's a quote attributed to um, Freud but he didn't probably say that there's no evidence that he said that he was a lifelong cigar smoker he smoked about 20 a day and he also had problems with this uh, new substance that they were playing with called cocaine and he was a, a, a physician originally so they would have like a cut or an arm amputation during um, during war and what they would do is put cocaine into the wound to numb the wound so they could operate on it without having to put the patient under or without the patient going through like a, a lot of trauma and so he and other physicians of the time started to experiment with cocaine he had a massive addiction to cocaine they had to go up and like like uh, basically doctors had to like drill new holes into his nasal passages just so he could breathe better so um, he had some serious addictions and when he beat those addictions later on in life that's when these grand ideas came out and his psychosexual stages and things came out for Freud so he also had this cigar smoking issue and he had cancer of the mouth that was removed a few times when it came back later in his life that's basically what ended his life uh, he made the choice to be given a massive amount of I believe it was morphine and opiates to end his life because he was in so much pain with cancer um, so you know I guess maybe he was in the oral fixation stage and never really cleared the stage and dealt with those issues um, I mean I don't know I think this is some of this is a lot of junk there are some ideas here that are interesting and mostly what they're doing here and what Freud's doing here and what uh, Freudians are doing here is saying there are unconscious things that we've dealt with or not dealt with in life that has helped us to become successful or to be where we want to be or they have not and that's really what this is saying so let's look at the other side of this there's a couple of really controversial parts of this classic psychoanalytic theory says the child identification with the same sex parent is the successful resolution of a complex either either or either the electro complex for the female young female or for the young male the Oedipus complex so basically the idea is that there's a, a stage or time when a boy would have an unconscious desire for his mother and then therefore a jealousy or hatred of his father and he fears the punishment from dad being castration you know cutting off his penis if dad found out about his feelings that's where some of this stuff people go what what is what in the world is he talking about I think he's going pretty far here and maybe common sense just tells us that we identify with an opposite sex parent earlier potentially um, and I'm not sure why that is but normally kids come around and they have a pretty good relationship with both what if the only parent in your house is your mom or dad so that's one of these things where I often wonder about this plus Freud was European and he grew up in a pretty wealthy European um, existence and he had a good education and his worldview is what's impacting and affecting what he's talking about here obviously I'm not sure cross-culturally that this always plays out perfectly it's another really negative about Freudian ideas so the female version of that is the electric complex and this idea of female penis envy and I mean that's one of the most I think probably the most uh, disturbing thing that he had talked about that 
young women want a penis and since they don't have one they feel like in their unconscious it must have been cut off they look at their father and wish they had one and want to be like him and they look at their mother and look down upon her because she doesn't have pants this stuff is just i think it's just crazy it's it's off the wall and maybe the result of too much cocaine but there, think about it this way it doesn't matter how you feel about it can you prove these scientifically these findings the end of these psychosexual stages and like the the end of the phallic stage Children cope with the threatening feelings by repressing them and by identifying with their rival parent. It's the if you can't beat them, you join them approach. Now, <clears throat> did I see in my young uh, boy's life that this played out, that he was a mama's boy? Absolutely. And I'll talk about that when we discuss development. It was really hard for me. Like, But why was that? Well you're going to have a closer connection with your mother, I think. And I think that happens even with young girls. But do we get along now? And are we pretty pretty close? We are. We definitely are. It, it worked its way through the whole process. But, you know, I think part of it, too, if, if, if you think about it logically, the mother is spending so much time with that child and needs to because they feel like that's the most important thing that they could be doing. And so there's some reason for that. So here's some TV families you might be familiar with. Um, some of them, uh, you'll, you'll see some of these issues pop up from time to time. The Simpsons have been on forever. And uh, different um, sitcoms will sometimes pull up these uh, Freudian ideas from time to time. It's, it's, it's amazing like how well aware people are of the Freudian psychodynamic model. It's almost like it's part of like... Um, the myth or lore of the human existence. So let's talk about defense mechanisms. So we said that initially, if you can't deal with these issues, that defense mechanisms are going to kick in to help you um, or repress these problems. So there's a bunch of different ones of these. Methods used by the ego to unconsciously protect itself against anxiety. And this is caused by conflicts between the id and super ego's um, demands and constraints. So the only unhealthy, they're only unhealthy when they cause self-defeating behavior and emotional problems. So remember, the it is the devil, superego is the angel in our little scenario here. And the defense mechanism is going to come into play when the ego cannot resolve this, this issue. So you have a defense mechanism to deal with it. The first one's repression. So we avoid the painful thoughts by forcing them in the back of our mind. It underlies all the other defensive mechanisms. For example, a witness to a murder doesn't remember the details when asked by police because unconsciously they don't want to relive those memories. Repression. We retreat to behaving or thinking like a child in order to avoid adult issues like throwing a temper tantrum or maybe pretending like we're hurt on the soccer field like these guys do. They roll around like they're little kids. Um, <clears throat> blaming referees when you failed. Um, that is something that you, you see grown men act like boys. There's another defense mechanism called diversion or displacement. Sorry, uh, d displacement diverts these sexual aggressive impulses to a more acceptable person or object. So, for example, if you are angry at your mother, you take it out on the dog. You, know, you kick the dog and yell at the dog instead of doing that to your mother because it's not socially acceptable to do so. Um, projection. That's where you disguise threatening impulses and att attributing those to others. So you want to break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend and then you accuse him or her of wanting to break up with you. And so that's your way of projecting your problems onto them so that maybe they will come, come about. I'll say one thing about the displacement at the top and the middle there, uh, it's Bo Jackson at the top, um, that a good carpenter never blames his tools. But these guys are uh, like Ortiz there smashing the phone in the dugout because he was called up an umpire. And Bo Jackson was pretty good at destroying his bats. He's also pretty good at doing just about anything he wanted to do on a football or baseball field. More defense mechanisms. Let's talk sublimation. This is how we expend energy 
on pro-social activities in order to avoid undesired activities. Like, you have anger issues, and instead of hitting people on the streets, you train as an MMA, f- MMA fighter. You take out those aggressions there. Or you uh, repress them there. You push them down into the sublimation. So you have negative en- experience, anger, and disappointment builds, and you have unproductive consequences if you run out there and start beating people up. But if you do that in a gym... That's a positive goal directing direction, and you're getting those aggressions out. It's kind of the same with football. People have said, um, Deacon Jones, one of the greatest defensive ends of all time, used to say, you know, in his day, in the 50s and 60s of playing football, in a racially divided America, if he were to go out there and, and smack a white man, he'd have been thrown in prison. But on the football field, he was paid money to do it. He's a guy, he's a guy that came up with the term sack, by the way. Um, Just passed away recently. He was one of the very best. But reaction formation, where you make unacceptable impulses into their opposite or acceptable form. You dislike your psych teacher, but you walk in every day saying, Man, Mr. Duez, you're the best. I love you, man. Instead of telling them what you really feel. And why do people behave this way? Freud says they're using the reaction formation as a defense mechanism to hide their true feelings in the exact opposite manner so instead of um, it's, it's, it's a way to just completely hide what your true feelings are and that is a defense mechanism another one here is called rationalization well we try to create logical explanations of our behavior just to explain it an example would be a person turned down for a date well they didn't want to go anyway they, they are not even sure why they asked them or a student who um, got a poor score on an exam, and it wasn't my fault. The exam was a mess. Or someone uh, doesn't get into UT, and that's where they always want to go. Their parents went there. Their grandparents went there. They didn't go. They don't. They don't like UT anyway. That's all they ever wanted to do was go there. Rationalism not only prevents anxiety, it may also protect the self-esteem and self-concept. So when we confront it with success or failure, people tend to attribute those achievements to their own qualities and skills while failures are blamed on other people. And we'll look at the attribution theory later in the semester. And that's one that students sometimes have some trouble with. But this is based in some ways upon the defense mechanism that Freud brings up. So, denial. That's another good one. I know in world history, everybody was like, denying. Hey, (sighs) Mr. Dewis, the Nile River. It's not the longest river in the world. They were in denial. Turned out that it wasn't the longest river in the world. Longest river in the world is the Amazon. They just recently discovered that, I guess using satellite imagery, that the mouth of the river was actually further downstream than they had thought. And actually, the, the, the Nile River wasn't the longest. See, they were in denial all, all this time, and they were probably right. We refuse to perceive reality in order to protect ourselves from it. Often this is done in the face of like an obvious truth. This is the rejection letter. And instead of you know, saying you didn't want to go to that school, you say instead... I, I didn't get rejected. I got accepted. Uh, but I, I chose to go to another school. You know, I, just, I didn't get enough money from them. <laughs> in, in a way, you didn't get any money from them. So denial functions to protect the ego from things the individual cannot cope with. And sometimes this is just, you know, flat out what we need to do to survive. Uh, denial requires a substantial investment of energy, and so does uh, many of these. They, they require all kinds of energy to be able to do this. So because of this, other defenses are also used to keep those unacceptable feelings from the consciousness. So we have a buildup of these defense mechanisms sometimes. Here's a quick slide, and you can look at this better in the slides in the notes and flip through it. But this is a good way of just you know focusing on these defense mechanisms and in the un- unconscious to maybe help you learn them a little bit better. So evaluating the psychodynamic approach. Freud incredible contributions to western thinking and psychology and there's no wonder he's so well known however there's limited support for certain aspects of freudian theory it's only based on a few case studies and the weaknesses in freud's theories are profound so is it culturally accept uh, accepted in other uh, in universal and other uh, places around the globe that's that's questionable does it does it not take social interaction into account? There's a lot of uh, there are a lot of holes. There's two ways that you can reject the scientific theory. 
it's wrong and it doesn't work. That's one way everybody's kind of familiar with. But what about the theory is so vague and all-encompassing that it can't be tested? Wolfgang Pauli, a physicist who was asked about the work of a colleague, said this. That guy's work is crap. He's not right. He's not even wrong. And, and you could say this about Freud because he doesn't really prove his theories. He has an overarching huge view of personality and the human experience. And there's not really a good way to prove that. So astrology and astrological predictions are very similar. It's not that they're wrong. It's that they can't be proven wrong. They can't even be proven right. They're just completely vague. Um, if you read your um, astrology uh, for today, and well, I'm the sign of the Gemini, and it says, um, be careful negotiating um, socially with other people. But you'll have great success and those things that you enjoy doing. I mean, things like that are just bizarre, and you can't really prove that wrong. Um, Freudian theory is also vague like that, and in some ways bizarre. Like, how can you prove these stages of psychosexual development across someone's entire lifetime? Now, case studies could be done, but can you really put that to a test? Freudian defenders say that it is proven through psychoanalysis. And you sit down with somebody and you go through the psychoanalytic process, Freud is right. But how can they be tested? So here's a good example of, of what I'm talking about. Freud says to a patient, you hate your mother. The patient replies, wow, that really makes sense. And Freud says, I'm right. Or in the, uh, the other case is Freud says to a patient, you hate your mother. The patient replies, no, I don't. That's disgusting. How dare you say that? And Freud says, your anger is the idea, the, your anger over this idea shows that it's very painful to you. You've repressed it in your unconsciousness and repressed it from your consciousness. I am right. Plus, you have deep psychological issues. Freudian theory pins itself to the unconscious, and there are many ways that the unconscious behavior is pivotal in the human experience. So, this is, that was kind of my negative thoughts about Freud. These are really very positive ideas of Freud you know your unconscious plays a role in your behavior. For example, language. We hear things that are said in like a backward or messed up way and unconsciously we fix it like that. Um, we'll see examples of that when we get to language and thought. Driving, chewing gum, shoelace tying, all these things where you quickly instinctively operate in the unconscious, we do this constantly. Uh, subliminal impressions, which we'll learn about later. There's a lot of empirical support for power of the unconscious in areas of social psychology, like hazing. It is illegal, but yet the, if you are hazed, the social psychology uh, shows us that you are more likely to enjoy the experience of being in that group. I'm not saying you should do this, but the more pain you go through and the more, uh, the more of a price you pay the, and the more invested in something, the more you end up getting enjoyment out of it. So after Freud... There's some, some neo-Freudians. Adler is one of them. Uh, he looked at childhood tensions, however, not in the same way that Freud did. He's looking for things like uh, the individual psychology, is what he called it, or his term for personality. Complex struggles and growth, uh, superiority and, and power. He comes up with the inferiority complex and is recognized for making major breakthroughs in that area. So he is a neo-Freudian or a new Freudian. Karen Hornet is another one, and she debunked some of his, um, you know, ideas of uh, the Oedipus complex that we discussed earlier, um, and the uh, the opposite of it, the Electra complex. And the biggest thing to know with Karen Hornet is that she believed the social aspects of childhood growth and development were important, and children were trying to overcome a sense of helplessness, not necessarily all these things tied to sex and those uh, those kinds of things. So her quote is, fortunately, psychoanalysis is not the only way to resolve inner conflicts. Life itself remains very effective therapy. Carl Jung is another person you really should know, and he does pop up on the test quite a lot because he takes Freud's theories, and as a neo-Freudian, takes it uh, to a point that some people feel like they, you can actually use it. Um, while contained a common reservoir of images derived from a species past, your unconsciousness can be collective across the entire uh, 
entire planet. We'll speak much more about Jung when we look at consciousness later, and I'll talk about that because that's a hard one to understand, like collective unconsciousness, that the human experience is tied together in your unconscious. That's hard for people to maybe wrap their head around, but there are some ways that that can kind of be proven, and you can kind of see that happening. But a psychotherapist, is, he founded analytical psychology. So he's developing the concepts of extroverted and introverted personalities. Archetypes is a big thing that he's known for. And the collective unconsciousness. So his work's been influential in psychiatry. And it has also been a, a point of emphasis in religion, literature, and other related fields. He's, his primary disagreement with Freud stemmed from their differing concepts of the unconscious. Jung, Jung, Jung saw theories of Freud being incomplete and unnecessarily negative and Jung is much more positive in that way. He talks about archetypes and we'll see a, an image here that shows archetypes the universal symbolic images that appear across cultures so like Darth Vader and Spider-Man those are two things where you'll see some of those things play out and evil and goodness that all cultures across the planet understand so this last part here is your all-purpose guide to epic movies. You've got the Harry Potter series, Star Wars, Matrix, Lord of the Rings, and Finding Nemo. And in each one, you've got a hero, the ancient mystagogue, the enemy, the threshold guardian, the shapeshifter, and the trickster. And you maybe you could make uh, a case that some of the characters are, are mis misplaced if you're really into these different series. But you can kind of see these play out. This sort of makes sense. Let's just look at the enemy, from Voldemort to Vader to the Matrix itself, the computer system, to Sauron. And I guess Darla is a good one, because Bruce was a friend to Fish. But anyway, um, that's all I've got for you on Freudian psychodynamic theory. Um, hopefully, you wrapped your head around this. I think his con contributions are, are large and important, but not empirical enough that we can hang our hats on and be sure about but they have impacted personality development in other areas. We'll look at trait theory and some other aspects of ways of looking at uh, personality in the next video. Uh, for now, don't forget to be awesome.